will be significantly disrupted in the next two or three years is, is it possible that you and your organizations are not changing fast enough to respond to that potential? The question is, is it possible that if you don't get started soon, like maybe as soon as you get back home, uh, that you really may find yourself in a couple closings? This year, the numbers, frankly, are going to be pretty similar. I don't think quite as bad, but a dramatic number of store closings. All over 100 years old, they all do billions of dollars of business each year, and they're all in significant trouble to, to vary. And I think about 25 major retailers that have gone bankrupt, and in the case of Radio Shack and Toys R Us, are pretty much gone away. Accelerated. So Walmart, which historically had not done many acquisitions at all in the last, I guess it's now about two years, has made about a half dozen acquisitions, in some cases, to get access to new customers. If you're familiar with the brand Bonobos or Eloquy or Mod Cloth, excuse me, buying Whole Foods about a year ago. And then another phenomenon that's going on is some of these bigger brands that are having difficulty growing have been going out and acquiring other brands as the way to try to accelerate. Yeah. You can't make money if you're a traditional retailer. Malls are going away. Just, you know, the sky is falling, locusts, all floods, everything you can possibly imagine going wrong, and I know that certainly there are a lot of problems, but this is a bit of a simplistic view of what's going on. And part of the reason for that is it's pretty clear physical retail is not going away, and part of the reason for that is there are actually a lot of stores opening, not quite as many opening as are closing, uh, but it's pretty hard to say that retail is going away when you see the pace of, you know, not only some of these companies that have been around for a while, opening quite a lot of stores, some of these newer brands I'll talk about a little bit in a minute, uh, actually investing in physical retail pretty heavily. And what is sometimes not understood amidst all this talk of doom and gloom is that physical retail in the United States, and I think it's, it's true, and by that I mean if you look on one end of the spectrum, the retailers that are really focused on speed, price, convenience, like Amazon, like Walmart, uh, Powerfield, luxury, special, experiential retailers, those retailers are doing pretty well in between. Not the best price, not the most convenient, not really good service, nothing really special. They're the ones that are really in trouble. And this is what I call the boring middle. Into three different categories, they said. They're basically price-oriented, or they're more premium or premier-oriented, or they're basically in the middle, not quite one or the other. And if you can see this, the five-year revenue growth on this basis, you can see quite a lot of growth in the value segment, growing at 16 17% or so the last few years, starting to moderate a little bit. But every forecast, this happens to be e-marketers numbers, but every forecast pretty much has e-commerce continuing to grow 14, 15 last year, I should say. About 90% of all retail is still done in the physical store. And even if you assume that really aggressive growth, you're still looking at maybe you know 85% of all retail still being done in the physical store. And this is really now, I guess, almost 10 years old. And you may remember, you know, there used to be bookstores and music stores, and you know, a lot of stores where you'd go into that that you could. Um, deliver those products digitally. Uh, and Amazon, of course, was one of the companies that really drove this. Um, that business just shifted mostly online, and the companies that were in the business of selling physical products, for the most part, that Amazon was this tiny little company selling books out of a warehouse in Seattle. And then here we are, 20 years later, where they're, you know, either the first or second most valuable company in the world. They've got this total e-commerce growth in the United States. Amazon accounted for over half of it. So you had up all the other dot-coms of all the big retailers, all the little companies, everywhere in between. Amazon grew more than every single one of them. Combined searches, whether you intend to buy it online or in the store, actually start on Amazon. So I, before I saw this data, I would have assumed it would have been Google, but Google is actually, I mean, it's the biggest part, but it's in that search engine number. So Amazon's search for, for uh, retail products is actually many times greater than even different markets is that a lot of retailers really find themselves you know, kind of edging towards the precipice if they don't change fast enough. And some have obviously already gone over, um, but many are just getting closer and closer and without significant you know, open stores. And there's this phenomenon of many of these brands in the US anyway that started online opening stores. But really what's happening is board retail is dead. And Sears, which is um, maybe still alive as of the moment, is, is probably the best example of this. So what I'd like to do is well, it's surviving in this world, but hopefully continuing to do to do well. And while it's a bit of a cliche to either go strongly towards that value side, speed, convenience, all the things that Amazon, Walmart, and Carrefour and others are really good at, Mercado Libre, uh, or go to the right and try to be more experiential, 
more special, more, more unique. And I think the problem for most of us, not all of us, is the choice of trying to out Amazon, Amazon, or out PowerPoint, PowerPoint is really not a choice. You know, just most of us don't have the market position, the capital, the expertise to really take on compliance, study different retailers, what I think are some of the essentials of really staying remarkable in this age of digital disruption. So what I like to end, one of the things I've, I've loved as a speaker now, I can tell if I'm doing okay, we'll get people take pictures. And part of the reason why I think this is so important, and I have not, I was not able to find the data for Brazil, I don't, I don't know that, ultimately ended up in a physical store, actually started in a digital channel. So this is not e-commerce. This is going to a website, going to a mobile site, to gather information, order online, pick up store, whatever, it might be a whole range of things. But what percent started in a digital channel, ended up in a physical store, a digital channel. And I've seen many retailers in the US say publicly, are actually three or four times as great as all of e-commerce. So as much attention as e-commerce gets as a separate thing, uh, digitally influenced physical stores is actually much again, we see this okay. In 2013, it was really, really tiny, but by 2016, it was almost 40 percent of all brick and mortar sales were somehow influenced by people using a smart clock. For Google in Europe, we might put this together, and so we had some of the European countries. Again, I could not find the data for South America, for Brazil or South America. Um, but what you can see is some of these purchases probably make sense if it's a sort of product that's expensive and everything has to be digital. And while I think that's very important. I think that could be a, a little bit misleading. And part of the reason for that is digital isn't always better. Uh, digital technology obviously does some incredible things that we <coughs> couldn't even imagine 10 years ago. There are many cases where it isn't always better, so you really need to understand the customer journey where it makes the most diverse. There are many times, depending upon your business, understand the color of the fabric, you know, which doesn't always look great on a computer or a phone, um, try it on, et cetera, talk to the sales associate, et cetera. Uh, started online, said they would never open stores, and have actually found not only are they opening stores, in many cases they're opening a lot of them, and in many cases the physical part of their business is now either the biggest part or the fastest growing. Understood. Well, actually, the physical experience is important, but we need to enable the whole transaction and customer journey using sales associates. Can do if you have sales associates and how to help the consumer. Uh, I call it the second one. And uh, again, I don't know how well this translates into or customer focused or customer obsessed or customer first, all that good at it. And so I think we have to ask ourselves why? Uh, is it just the wording or, or is there something else? Um, this is one of my favorite things. You get, the, you get the recording, people say your call is very important to us, uh, but if it was, maybe you would actually answer the phone. So I guess my point is we say a lot of things. Um, but sometimes we don't seem to do them very well. Customer, um, as if it were one person that was all the same, which I'll come back to. Uh, but also sometimes I think we really, when we talk about customers, it's, it's very flat. When we talk about humans and really try to think about more the emotional connection part, I think we maybe get a little bit different perspective on what we need to do to really um, serve those customers better. Customer journey and where digital is the right way to go is to really deeply understand the customer journey. But probably is just think about three parts of the customer journey. If you think about all the ways that the customers are researching for the product, going to the store, buying it, all the steps. Is, is your experience or is the customer's experience bad? Are there pain points? Is there friction that you need to eliminate? Is it just okay? Or is it a real wow? And then really the question is, does it, does it matter? Because in some cases, you, can, you just need to be as good as the competition. You don't need to invest a lot of energy because the customer doesn't care. The third one I want to talk about is what I call Harmonize. Honestly, the idea of the promise of Omnichannel is really that you're one brand, but you operate in many channels. But the idea, I think, is to realize that we as retailers talk about channels, but customers never talk about channels. You know, the customer is the channel, they are going to go back and forth between many ways of shopping, in many cases in an instant. And it's our job to figure out how to make that all work together beautifully. So again, I'm not sure how well this will translate, but the reason why I think harmonized rather than omni-channel or seamless 
or unified or some of these other words that people use is really this idea like in music that something that sounds beautiful in music, if you eliminate all the bad notes and you get a lot of different silos in the organization. This can be that e-commerce is very separate from physical stores. This can be inventory silos and putting the technology in place, putting the incentives in place, putting the metrics in place then you can talk about omni-channel or seamless or harmonized or whatever all you want and you're not going to make a lot of progress. It will, it will just be very... Uh, I got to Neiman Marcus in 2004 and I was, became responsible for what we called it multi-channel at the time. Um, we were pretty impressed even way back then. We now up to 70 or 80 stores. And uh, what I sometimes talk about back and forth all the time, and I think one of the advantages of these newer brands is they started online so they have a lot of digital capabilities, they have a lot of great customer data, and then they're picking their stores to go where they have the best customer potential, they're picking the best real estate, they're building in the right size, and so compared to some of the other retailers that are stuck with maybe not the best locations anymore, or stores that are too big. Best Buy, Walmart, Target, I think all in the last year, have really started to make some inroads and e-commerce capabilities much better. They were definitely behind and they invested in them. But the other thing they did was rather than look as, at stores as a problem or a liability, they said, no, stores can actually be an asset. We just may have to operate them differently. So they started to really embrace this blur of thinking, okay, stores are good at this, online is good at this. How do we make them work better together? And as they've started to do that, um, their results have improved quite a lot. 50% of customers are using their phone in, in the customer journey. I think that's pretty obvious that it's becoming more. 12 years ago, we used to talk about going online. And I had a log into the computer to get online. And now, really, we live online. Most people have their phone with them all the time. And you know, when the speaker at a conference gets boring, they're on their phone. And when you're in line waiting for something, <laughs> you get on your phone. And so they dissected the mobile journey into four kinds of customer behavior. The first is I want to know moments. So think about this basically as collecting the I want to go moments. So think about this as, okay, now I've done my research, now I want to go to that particular store. So maybe I just want to look at the direction of, this could be you're fixing up your bathroom and you're trying to get tips and you're trying to figure out all the different products you want to buy, or maybe you're cooking and you're exacting. And what the Google research shows in general is that retailers are really good at hyper-focusing on the I want to buy moments. But, is, but if you don't do well with the customer along that journey, you may never get to the point where they can buy anything from you. So a lot of you're in the customer journey and figuring out how to really be remarkable in the moments that matter ultimately um, to the shopping, then shopping and mobile devices, doing a good job through the whole steps of the process. So if you've ever used the Starbucks app, you, know, you can order ahead, you can check your loyalty points, you can pay, it's a special promotion. And this really, I think, comes back to this idea that very few customers really want to be average. But I think more importantly, today, you know, 15 years ago, if you were going to buy something, you were pretty much stuck with whatever was available in your town. Now, obviously, just you need to get about anything you want, anytime, anywhere. And so, in this world of choices, customers, you know, can, can search around for everything, and it's very hard to get away with being average idea to talk about the customer because every retailer, every company has all sorts of different customers and part of the way you get into trouble is trying to treat everybody like they're the customer inside, really leveraging the data that you have or can get about customers to inform your decisions. So a couple of quick examples here. This is uh, Zalando. I think we're seeing more and more of this. I'll talk about another example in a second. Uh, but this is Coach which is built out a line of handbags. A simple idea, again, something I talked about earlier, but once the internet became pretty much, you know, the local physical boundaries and our ability to connect with people were, were suddenly gone. And that allows for many different types of opportunities to collaborate on product reviews, to collaborate on, on products, to collaborate business to business. And so it's obviously changed the game. I think probably the, the biggest one from a marketing standpoint is how much peer-to-peer -peer influence is changing businesses. My, my guess is on me. Um, this is a site, don't think they've expanded much beyond the, uh, the US, but this is a business called Rent the Runway, which very straightforward, they rent high fashion products. So instead of spending a lot of money on a gown that or a fancy dress that you may only wear once, 
you can rent it just like men might rent to you know, not own things, but rent things, you know, that obviously can have a huge effect. You know, if you're on the, in the business of selling things uh, and then suddenly your customer decides they want, they're okay renting them or borrowing them, um, you know, that's a really different, different dynamic. So still, uh, assuming I have it, you know, speed up a little bit, on number seven, which I call memorable. And this is really reflecting what I was talking about earlier about the difficulty of being stuck in the middle, being boring, mediocre, or whatever words you want to use. And, and I would say like, I'm still struck by how much of retail looks almost exactly the same. The store designs, the malls look the same. You go inside the store, the country now is if you go to the biggest department store, I hope I'm not offending anybody in the audience, but if you go to the biggest department store and go to the women's apparel or the men's apparel or whatever, this is pretty much what it looks like, whether you're in Sydney or Hamburg or Sao Paulo, I'm guessing. Uh, now, does anybody know what this is? Apple Store. Okay, I've done this maybe 20 times um, and pretty fun. I don't know if it'll ever make any money, but it's a fun place to go. There four keys to this. The first, perhaps the most obvious, is be unique. It's always been important to have a unique value proposition or selling proposition, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's also got to be intensely relevant. It's not enough to be different. Uh, it also has to matter. So, you know, I think it's a really amplified wow. So if some of you heard, I don't know what Seth talked about last year, um, but if you read his book, Purple Cow, one of the things he talks about when he says to be remarkable is literally that people will talk about it, that the, the experience of the product is so memorable that you know you want to tell your friends, you want to put it on Instagram, whatever. You know That's something that really rises above but they, um, excuse me, take uh, different strategies that retailers are using around the world to be more memorable. And I'm hoping in the Tiger Home you might love or how you would wish, wish it would look by having all these different rooms incredibly decorated. But there's also restaurants, there's sitting areas. Um, this one is in the experience. This is a, uh, actually it's an illustration from a store that they just opened in Shanghai. And in addition to this, to be able to um, roast beans right there in the store, so it's very fresh, it's a whole, whole different kind of experience of taking your store and just shrinking it a little bit to try to fit into a new space or be more productive. Uh, what Nordstrom has done with these local stores, and if you've been to a Nordstrom, typical Nordstrom stores, big, has all sorts of categories, uh, this has no product for sale in it. It's basically a service store where you can go and get wardrobe advice, but the other thing which you can somewhat see in this picture is it's also an outpost for online pickup in store. So one of the things, because there aren't that many Nordstrom stores, it can actually be a bit of a hassle to go pick up your product. A lot of the product is the same. So one of the things we're starting to see in the U.S. is a lot more investment in store only for education, which is actually outside of Dallas, Texas, where I live. And what they're doing, it's basically a series of pop-up stores, um, and they're changing the retailers that will be in there every three to six months. Some of the brands that are in there are these new brands that are experimenting with opening store uh, about them. And then you go and order online and the product gets delivered to your store. So it really changes the idea of sales per square foot and some of the other metrics when you have a store where you're paying rent, you have the salespeople, but you're not actually selling the experience. So um, if you haven't been, I would encourage you to go to the new Nike store just up the street. Um, this is a shot from there where among the things that they're doing in there is they have uh, custom, custom shoes several thousand over the next few years. Uh, so this is very expensive to implement, but um, having been to a few of them, it's just pretty cool technology. The places I've consulted and um, just observed is, if you look at the retailers that have gotten into trouble, mostly it's because they were afraid to change. That they define their business in a certain way, or they just define the risks they were willing to take in a certain way, and they could never get themselves to really embrace change. You know, another, another self go quote, if you're not willing to fail, uh, you're not likely to be successful. And most retailers that I've seen just do not have a good process and culturally are, are afraid to fail. So one of the ways to reduce risk and do a better job of this is to develop what I call a culture of experimentation. Is to say, you know, we're going to try a lot of things. Not all of them are going to work. Uh, the ones that are working, you invest behind aggressively. The ones that don't work, you figure that out quickly and you, and you drop them. But this kind of idea that you're going to somehow magically uh, innovate your company without taking a lot of risk, I think it's, it's, a, real, it's a real problem. So those are the eight. Um, again, I hope some of those were relevant to your particular situation. You're able to grade yourself 
a little bit and maybe get some ideas about what you might do. Um, but just to wrap up, I want to use this Chinese proverb that I really like that some of you may know. It goes like this. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And so I hope for all of you, when you have a, you find yourself being stuck in boring versus choosing remarkable, I hope you choose remarkable. I hope uh, if you pondered some of those questions, maybe you realize you need to speed up a little bit. So if you're going to speed up, I hope you'll uh, be willing to embrace a culture of experimentation. But mostly, I hope you can get started. But maybe when you get back to Brazil, you can invest up. That's it. Obrigado. That's my time.